Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, please send it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Be sure to cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to let you know about Netflix. Netflix brings a world of great entertainment to you. You get access to classic films like Laura, The Thin Man, The uh, the Third Man, and so much more. I just actually received the second Thin Man movie after The Thin Man, and I'm going to watch that uh, shortly. There's more than 100,000 DVD titles in Netflix's library, as well as a lot of great instant watch options that are available on a 170 million different devices. You can try Netflix out on a free trial. Go to netflix.greatdetectives.net to get started. But let's go ahead and we'll get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes, The Singular Affair of the White Cockerel. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, uh, come in, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, my boy. How are you feeling after your Christmas holiday? Remarkably well, thank you, Mr. Bell, considering how extremely hospitable my friends have been. <laughs> Just a twinge or two of gout to remind me that an old man should treat tawny port with the respect that it deserves. I know <laughs> just what you mean, Dr. Watson. Well, draw up your usual chair, my boy. And settle yourself down. Yeah. That's it. All ready with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bell. And when I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived, I came across this white feather. It played a prominent part in tonight's adventure. A white feather? That signifies cowardice, doesn't it? Yes, it can. It can, Mr. Bell. It can. But this is a very special feather. It was plucked from a white cockerel, and it helped Sherlock Holmes to foil one of the most diabolical plots that we ever encountered. But first, don't you want to have your your usual word with our listeners? Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Men, if you want to stand out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use Kreml hair tonic. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps hair neatly in place longer, too. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Kreml always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the story of the white cockerel? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place after Sherlock Holmes had given up his regular practice and retired to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I was staying with him there for a few weeks' holiday, and I remember coming down to breakfast one morning to find my old friend, his pipe clenched between his teeth, squatting on a stool, examining the contents of a large metal box at his feet. As he threw back the lid, I could see that the box was half full of papers, papers tied up with red tape in separate packages. After sorting through them for for a few moments, he turned to me and said, 
A box of secrets, my dear Watson. A box of deep, dark secrets. Are they the records of your early cases, Holmes? Yes, my boy. These were all done before my biographer had come to glorify me. I've often wished that I had the notes on them. So that you might transmute my little adventures into those rather florid stories of yours? My stories aren't florid. They're factual accounts of what happened. Oh, don't be hurt, my dear oh, fellow. It's much too story. early in the day. Mm-hmm. Well, Watson, perhaps someday the world will hear of these cases. They're not all successes, but there are some pretty little problems among them. I'm sure there are. For example... Here's the record of the Tarleton murders. And here's the case of Bambury, the wine merchant. What happened to him? He died, Watson, under peculiarly horrible circumstances. Oh, really? That case was one of my failures, I'm afraid. Aha! This adventure was really a little recherche. It's a full account of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. Yes, yes, I, I vaguely remember her dreadful woman. Ghosts from the past, Watson. Ghosts to remind me that my heyday's long oh, past. <laughs> rubbish. I'm quite sure that if a case were to present itself at this moment, you'd be totally unable to resist it. You're wrong, old chap. Look at this note, derived just before you came downstairs. Mr. Manderby, the local squire, apparently needs my help. And yet I assure you I'm not in the least tempted to give it to him. Oh, may I see it? Certainly. Here. Yeah. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I need your help desperately. Have the goodness to call on me as soon as convenience permits. Continued theft of chickens may appear to be a small matter. <laughs> chickens, good gracious me. But I assure you that there are sinister forces at work. <laughs> Asking you to catch a chicken thief. Well, <laughs> really, Holmes. Yes, Watson, chickens. Something of a come down, isn't it? Well, do you know this, Mr. Mandeville? No. But surely his handwriting gives you a clue to his character. Well, it's legible and regular. A man of business habits, I should say, and of some force of character. No, no, Watson. Oh, sorry? Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A, and the L an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There's vacillation in his case and self-esteem in his capital. That's amazing, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. And our long association together should remind you of the fact. I'm afraid you're getting rusty. Well, perhaps you're getting rusty too, Holmes. And since the sun is shining and this letter comes from a neighbor of yours, it might be rather interesting to... uh... Call on Mr. Manderby. Exactly. I'd like to see if your analysis of his character matches the gentleman himself. In any case, Holmes... He may really be in trouble, you know. Watson, you're like an old war horse hearing a nearly forgotten bugle. Yeah, I dare say, Holmes. But even for stolen chickens, it's good to be in harness with you again. When that wistful tone creeps into your voice, I can't refuse you, Watson. Very well. Let's stroll across the downs and investigate the mystery of Mr. Mandeby's chickens. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you and your friend came here so promptly. It would seem to me, Mr. Manderby, that uh, your wisest course would have been to call in the local police. I did. The idiots scoffed at me. Indeed, Mr. Manderby? Why? Well, they said if they had to track down all the chicken thieves in these parts, they'd have no time for their more important duties. I must admit that I can follow their reasoning, sir. Well, I can't, since they seem to spend most of their time playing skittles in the Star and Garter local sergeant appears to have been selected for his complete lack of grey matter. and one iota of imagination. He's unable to see in what respect this differs from an ordinary chicken theft. Well, in what way does it differ, Mr. Bandover? Well, the chicken coops were broken into with considerable ingenuity. The thief could have taken uh, all he could carry. But he stole only one chicken. A white cockerel. A white cockerel... When did this take place? Uh, Early last evening. Uh, That was when I uh, sent my note to you, Mr. Holmes. But in the early hours of this morning, a burglar broke into the house itself. And what was stolen this time? Again, the thief took only one object. My daughter's hairbrush. Does your daughter know of these thefts? No, no, I didn't tell her. The child's full enough of peculiar fancies as it is. A white cockerel and a hairbrush. Mr. Manderby... I came here against my better judgment, but thank heaven I did. Please let me talk to your daughter at once. Unless I'm very much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. Uh, A 
Alicia's uh, playing in the drawing room. I'll take you in. I think if you don't mind, Mr. Manderby, that uh, we would prefer to see her alone. Rubbish. What could you possibly wish to say to my daughter that you couldn't say in front of me? Well, since my friend has been kind enough to help you, sir, I think you'd better let him conduct his investigation in his own manner. Oh, very, very, very well. All sounds unnecessarily mysterious to me. Uh, I, I'll be in my study. Dreadfully pompous fellow. You were right in your analysis of his character, Holmes. Well, let's go in. Shh. Listen to the piano, Watson. What a weird tune. Yes. An odd, primitive melody to hear in the heart of the English countryside. Very curious. Come in. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, it isn't Father. Who are you, gentlemen? Miss Manderby, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, my dear? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I knew you lived in the neighborhood... Why are you here? At your father's request. Well, nothing's wrong, is it, Mr. Holmes? I'm not sure, Miss Manderby. That's why we've come to talk to you. Oh, may we sit down, my dear? Oh, yes, of course. Please forgive me. Thank you, sir. You play the piano excellently, Miss Manderby. Have you ever thought of concert work? Concert work? Oh, no, sir. Papa'd never allow it. He needs me here all the time. You don't see many people here at the house. No, Dr. Watson. Papa doesn't like me to cultivate any friends... He wishes me to devote all my attention to him. Extremely selfish and medieval point of view, it would seem to me. Oh, please, Mr. Holmes. You mustn't say anything against Papa. If he knew that we were talking about him, he'd be furious. Then uh, let me confine myself to you, Miss Manderby. Do you know of anyone in this neighborhood who might uh, wish you serious harm? Uh, no. No, I don't. I, uh... As I told you, I, I hardly know anyone. Then why, my dear young lady, are you so obviously terrified of your own shadow? Please don't ask me that. I haven't even had the courage to tell Papa. Possibly not, my dear, but Mr. Holmes is here to help you and to protect you. That's why he insisted on our seeing you alone. Yes, Miss Manderby. And uh, a trouble shared, you know? Very well, Mr. Holmes. I will tell you. I've got to tell someone. Last night I had a, a ghastly dream. I dreamed that I was in some foreign country, in the jungle... I was tied to a stone slab, and a group of natives danced around me, waving knives. And they were all wearing terrifying masks. Oh, my dear, it sounds like too much lobster for supper. Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Uh, please continue, Miss Manderby. All the time I could hear a strange, haunting pipe playing in the background. It sounded like some sort of flute, and there was a drum beating out a slow, rhythmic beat. The same rhythm that you were playing on the piano as we came in? Why, yes. It's been haunting me ever since I awakened this morning. It goes like this. Suddenly, Mr. Holmes, I awakened from the nightmare. But I could still hear the melody continuing. I went to the window... And in the moonlight, I saw a tall man walking below. Could you recognize him? No, Mr. Holmes. He was disappearing through the shrubbery and his back was turned. But his hands were raised to his mouth. And I could hear the same melody being played on some kind of flute. It was awful, awful. You haven't told your father about it? No, Dr. Watson. He wouldn't have believed me. Papa's always accusing me of being fanciful. Oh, but I'm not. Really, I'm not. Miss Manderby, I'm glad that you've told us this. Though I suggest that you continue to keep the incident a secret from your father. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. All right, Holmes. Goodbye, my dear, and courage, Miss Manderby. You have friends now. Good day, gentlemen. And thank you. Holmes, what the devil's all this about? When I can answer that question, Watson, the case will be solved. As it is, there's work to be done. Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Yes, Mr. Manderby. Here we are. Yeah, I hope you find out what's wrong with the lassie. She uh, hasn't been herself today. A change from her normal self, where you are concerned, might be a benefit, sir. Yes, indeed. The poor girl seems completely terrified of you, sir. The problem of my daughter's relationship with her father is no possible concern of yours. I asked you here on a simple matter of detection. Detection, yes. 
but far from simple. I warn you, you're in serious danger of the loss of a great deal more than a white cockerel and a hairbrush. Be on your guard, Mr. Manderby. Dr. Watson and I must conduct a little investigation in the village. You may expect a call from us later in the day. Well, Watson, here we are at Larches. Charming house, but I still don't see quite why we're here. Because my inquiries uncovered the fact that this is the only house in the neighborhood with relatively new tenants. When something extraordinary happens in the peaceful countryside, look first for a newcomer. The owner's name is Mr. George Shapley. Let's see what information the gentleman can give us. Listen to that, Holmes. Sounds like a flute. Yes, Watson. And the melody is the same that Miss Manderby played for us on the piano. And this house is only a stone's throw away from hers. Precisely. Yes, gentlemen. Mr. Shapley? Yes. My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How are you, doctor? Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm something of a student of music. We were walking past your house, and I heard what sounded like a flute playing a strange it melody. It seemed to come from the direction of the stables over there. Oh, that. <laughs> it's my manservant, Harker. He's a West Indian. Brought him over with me from Trinidad. He's quite a musician. <laughs> In an amateur sort of way, you know. I wonder if I might speak to him. Of course you can, Mr. Holmes. I'll walk you over there. Thank you. We were thinking of getting up a little entertainment in the village for the church ladies' bazaar. Perhaps your man would uh, consider contributing his services. You can ask him. He spends two or three hours a day out here practicing. Harker. Yes? Come here a minute. Yes, Mr. Harper. These gentlemen heard you playing and wondered if you'd like to do something for some... Oh, <laughs> some village concert or other. Oh, that's flattering. We're organizing a musical soiree for the church ladies in a few weeks. Yes, sir, man, and we'd like you to play for us. I'm only an amateur, but I'll be very glad to help, gentlemen. That uh, instrument you were playing, it had an odd quality. Was it a flute? Uh, yes, sir, though I doubt if you've ever seen one like it. Look for yourself. Good Lord, looks as if it's made of bone. It is, sir, from a human leg bone. Really? It's about 200 years old and originally came from Brazil. It's quite a collector's item. I'm sure it is. Tell me, Harker... Since you're from the West Indies and uh, obviously a lover of music, I presume you're familiar with some of the primitive melodies indigenous to that part of the world. Some of the tribal chants, for instance. Oh, yes, sir. I know many of them. Perhaps you'd play some at the concert. I'd rather not, sir. Primitive chants are dangerous medicine when their evil powers are not appreciated or understood. I quite agree with you, Harker. Well, well, I'm much obliged to you, and uh, we shall count on you for the concert. Good day to you both. Come on, Watson. Uh, good day. Good day, good day, good day. Dr. Watson. That servant's our man, Holmes. He lives within two houses of Miss Manderby, and he plays the flute. Well, Watson, though I don't think the pattern is remotely as clear as you think, I'll agree that suspicion would seem to focus on the servant, Harker. I could even produce another clue that points to it. You could? I picked this object from his coat as he turned to you during the conversation. None of you noticed it. What is it? Look for yourself, Watson. Here. Great heavens! It's a feather from a white cockerel. Holmes, I thought you said we were going back to Mr. Mandeville's house before the day is over. We are, Watson. Why are we back here at your bee farm? It's 8.30 in the evening now. We shall call on Mr. Mandeville before long. My investigations are complete. What luck did you have well, with I did, as you told me, and made exhaustive inquiries in the village. With what results? I couldn't find out much about Mr. Shapley. Nobody knows anything about the man except that he has a foreign manservant and that he paid cash for his house and deposited a large sum of money in the local bank. Uh, what did you discover? I see that you've been up to your ears in reference books. Yes, Watson. Books concerning the peculiarly revolting ceremonies connected with voodooism. Voodooism? That's black magic. But flourishing in our English countryside, apparently. A white cockerel is the second finest sacrifice in voodoo magic associated with the West Indian chance. That accounts for the first theft. How about the stolen hairbrush? 
In all such magic, the possession of intensely personal objects, particularly human hair, is considered to give great supernatural powers over that person. Then it's obvious that West Indian servant is trying to get power over Miss Mandeby. Holmes, you spoke of a white cockerel being the second finest sacrifice. What is the first? A human sacrifice. The sacrifice of a young girl. Great Scott. And tomorrow night the moon is full. I think that tonight the girl should be safe. Though, of course, we'll go over there at look, once. Look, 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 Holmes. The lights of a carriage are coming up your drawer, your mm. driveway. And it's no social call. It's driving at a gallop. Come on, Watson. I have, uh, have nothing that's happened to Miss Mandeby already before we get her. Who is it? What's wrong? Uh, it's Robert Mandeby. What's happened to Mr. Mandeby? Alicia, my daughter, she's disappeared. The whole neighborhood searching for her. For heaven's sake, both of you come at once. <laughs> We'll find out in a moment what Sherlock Holmes decides to do now. But first, men, why not start today and take better care of the hair you've got? Remember, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Cremel. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Cremel at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Cremel is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. A quick massage with Cremel helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? You and the great Sherlock Holmes drove over to Mr. Manderby's house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, as fast as the pony and trap could carry us there. When we arrived, Manderby quickly led us to the shrubbery beneath his daughter's window. Yes, you, uh, you can see how the fiend got into the house, Mr. Holmes. By climbing this trellis work. Hmm... Footprints in the earth leading toward it, but none leaving. And the man, whoever he was, must have left the house by some other exit. An amazing deduction, Watson. There's no need to be sarcastic. Holmes, we should go to Shapter's house at once. It's obvious that that's where the danger lies. Before saying that anything is obvious, Watson, I'd like your help in trying an experiment. Yes, of course, Holmes. Well, what is it? Try climbing that trellis for me, will you? you give me all the best jobs, don't you? Let me hand, will you, Uncle? Here you are. Up you go. You know, Holmes, it seems to me you're wasting valuable time. Mr. Manderby. Since you asked my help, I suggest you let me handle the case in my own way. Holmes, I don't think this trellis is going to hold my way. Look out, Holmes! Oh, oh! Bravo, Watson. Your test has been invaluable. What do you mean it's been invaluable? I think I've broken my back. I'm sure you'll survive. Come on, old chap. Get on your feet. We'll go to Mr. Shapley's house at once. I only hope we're not too late to prevent a tragedy. Light coming from the stables, Holmes. Music, too. Listen. It's that West Indian playing his devilish chant again. Master Watson. Look, look, look. There's someone standing in the shadows by the harness room there. It's Mr. Shapley. Good evening, sir. Mr. Who? Dr. Watson. Thank heavens you're here. What's wrong, Mr. Shapley? Look in that empty store there. You can see through the broken plank in the wall. The one where the music's coming from. Good heavens. Look, Holmes. There's Miss Mandeby lying on the floor unconscious. Yes, with a dead white cockerel beside her and a fire smoldering in the corner. And you think that servant of mine's in there playing his filthy music? Uh, I don't see him. Mr. Holmes, I've got a revolver. I'm going in to get him. I think we'll come with you, Mr. Shepard. No, no. He's my servant. I'll take care of him myself. Archie Watson. Give me that revolver. Give it to me, I say. What do you think you're doing, yes, Mr. Holmes? I told you, you knocked the revolver right over his hand. Pick it up, Watson. 
I have a profound dislike for seeing murder committed under my very eyes. Murder? But the potential murder is Harker, the, the servant. Indeed. There. Then why is his unconscious body lying in the corner it there? It can't be. The music's still playing. That's his flute. Yes, and it's accompanied by a drum. A remarkable feat even for a man not lying unconscious on the floor. The music is undoubtedly that of a gramophone. You're remarkably quiet, Mr. Well, Harker. Of he is. He's unconscious. My dear Watson, you're overlooking an important fact. It's a case of identity. The West Indian gentleman lying on the floor is the master, Mr. Shapley. This man is the servant, Harker. Let me... No, you don't. Let me... Let me... I've got him home. Let go of me. You can't prove anything. I can and I will. You'll go to prison for this night's work. Watson, see what may be done to arrive at the house while I turn this man over to the police. How is Miss Manderby, Watson? She's, uh, she's going to be all right, Holmes. I took her home to her father's and left instructions for her, her care. How are you feeling, Shepard? Fine, thank you, Dr. Watson. But I'm waiting for Mr. Holmes to explain this nice happenings to me. Well, so am I, as usual. Then let me analyze this singular affair in its uh, logical progression. I early concluded that you, Mr. Shapley, were the master, and the other man was the servant. Right, Mr. Holmes, but I didn't know how you knew it. Your speech and manner suggested nothing else. You reversed roles, I imagine, because it was an easier way to rent a house in the English countryside. That was the reason, Mr. Holmes. In my previous visits, I've discerned a certain prejudice against foreigners. That's a shocking thing, but I, I wouldn't doubt it, Mr. Shapley. You decided to live here... Your health, I suppose. No, Doctor. I came to the English countryside for peace. Peace to conclude my studies on the origin and history of West Indian native music. I see. I've been working in close conjunction with Professor Griffiths of the Brighton College of Anthropology. It was he who concerned me to make graphophone records my works with a view to recording them for musical archives. And your servant saw his advantage. When you decided to change identities, he realized that if he disposed of you, he would be able to continue in his false character as the supposed Mr. Shapley. He could have taken over your large bank balance and retired under yet a third name with the proceeds. And then he concocted this elaborate plot involving voodoo and native chants, knowing that his master would be suspect. Precisely. He drugged his master, placed him in the incriminating trap, and then planned to burst in just ahead of us and shoot him. But, Holmes, the white feather you found on Mr. Shapley's coat undoubtedly planted there. Mr. Holmes, I still don't see how you knew that my man was responsible. The first clue was the trellis. It's obvious that you never claim, climbed that. You're heavier than Dr. Watson, and it wouldn't support his weight. Your servant was a small, light man. Obviously, it was he. Well, I see it all now. And then, of course, when we heard the music while Mr. Shapley was still lying unconscious, it was obvious that the whole thing was a plot. Oh, what, a, what a shocking business. Yes, but I can't tell you how grateful I am to you, gentlemen. You saved my life. Mr. Holmes, I must insist on paying you a handsome fee. A fee? No, Mr. Shapley. I couldn't dream of accepting one. Some people in my country have been sufficiently inhospitable to a foreigner to make him believe it advisable to change places with his own servant. Presumably, this was done in order to obtain tolerance and peace. Surely the least I can do is to see that his stay on these shores is a tolerable one. Girls, I imagine most of you are planning to go out to a party or a dance on New Year's Eve, or perhaps just spend a quiet evening with friends. Naturally, you want your hair to look its best. So why not follow this beauty tip from those divinely beautiful Powers models? We wash our hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazing beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair, revealing all its natural glossy luster. And so many women tell me how wonderful Cremel Shampoo is for washing children's hair. <laughs> well, you can readily see why. Because Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle on the hair. Its luxurious active foam removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if only you could see how Powers Models hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. 
Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, Mr. Bell, next week I think I'll tell you a story I call the Darlington Substitution Case. It's a strange story of how Holmes saved a prominent British peer from scandal and disgrace by exercising the judgment of Solomon. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Mazarin Stone. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the Darlington substitution case. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. Pretty good for a mystery that started out to be just about a missing chicken. Some pretty good twist, I, th- I thought, particularly towards the end with who the servant was and who the master was and the way that was uh, deduced. And a pretty strong message uh, against prejudice in here. I should mention, this is actually the last Sherlock Holmes uh, episode of 1946. So next week's shows are uh, uh, for 1947. Now we turn to listener comments and email. Uh, We got another review on the Android app. This one from Jason said, The shows are scattered. No way to sort according to show. Going back to old-time radio free version. Um, well, I definitely appreciate the concern, and I, I'd agree that would be a good feature to have to be able to separate the shows out by uh, the type of episode. Unfortunately, it's not a capability of the app. However, I, I tend to think, and we've had some new people sign up with the app, the, big, the, the two big things about the app, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, or three big things, is number one, you can easily contact the show uh, right from your phone. The button there, so you contact us easily. Number two, we've got all the extras that we uh, put up there, generally somewhere between one, uh, one and four each month. And then the third thing is the ability to star your favorite episodes. You put a, you press the star by your favorite episode, and then anytime you want to be able to listen to it, you just press the star button. And that can be nice to make sure you don't have to, you know, keep it on your computer together or, or forever or scroll down through it. You can press that star by an episode, and it's going to be there for you whenever you're going to want to listen to it. So thanks so much for the uh, feedback, and I hope that uh, clarifies. We have an email from Christine. says, I'm a listener from Scotland, and I love your show. I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan, and I... Have only listened to those so far, but we'll start in the rest of the shows once these are done. Thanks for the work you put into these shows. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks so much, Christine. I really appreciate it and really want to go to Scotland someday. That, as they say in the 21st century, is on the bucket list. And we close with a just a very nice thanks, Adam, off of a Podcast Alley from Justin. Well, thanks so much. And uh, appreciate everybody's support. We will be back. Uh, tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and next week with another episode of Sherlock Holmes. In the meanwhile, you can become one of our friends over on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.